Well, how are you guys doing? Well, good, good. Let me tell you about a couple of things before we get started. Next week, I'm really excited. It's going to be our fall kickoff. Hopefully, everybody's back from vacation and uh, invite some friends because we're going to be talking for five weeks in a series called The Church Is. And each week, we're going to talk about a different thing that the church is, or at least what it should be. And we're going to kick off with the church's family. And so it's a great week for people to see, hopefully, some, some cool stories about what our church is already doing to live as a family, but also how we can be challenged to do better and to understand what the church should be. And so we'll do that for five straight weeks. So we've got some cool stuff. Uh, you'll see more about it in emails, talk a little more about it in the sermon. So as far as the church being a family, there's something important that you can also do. We start community group signups next week as well. So get involved in a community group. It's a small group where you get to know some people in our church a little better, study God's word together, hang out, do life together, get to know some people that can support you, encourage you, and who you can support and encourage when they need it as well. So make sure you do those things. All right, let's get started. Do you guys remember the movie Back to the Future? How many of you have seen it, right? Do you know how long ago it was that it came out? 30 Eight years at this point. Yeah. So if you got to see it on the big screen, you're old. I don't know how else to tell you. Uh, but you may know the basic plot of the movie. Uh, so Marty McFly, who's played by Michael J. Fox, is running from some terrorists that shot his buddy, uh, Doc Brown, who the reason they shot him is because he stole their plutonium to fuel the uh, time machine that he built into a DeLorean car that, you know, when it got up to 88 miles per hour, it would go back to the future. And so in the scene, Michael J. Fox is running and he jumps into the DeLorean car and he takes off and he accidentally gets up to 88 miles an hour and he time travels back to the 1950s and he meets his parents while they were still in high school. He completely messes up the timeline because his mom falls in love with him instead of his dad. Lots of problems with that if you think about it. And, but by the end of the movie, everything is even better than it was before. Now, I'm sorry about that spoiler, but if you haven't watched it by now, that, that's on you. I can't help that. <laughs> but so if you remember a scene towards the end of the movie, they're in the 1950s and Marty and Doc Brown, they're trying to generate the 1.21 gigawatts that they need to get him back to the future, and so they're going to capture a lightning strike. And there was this known lightning strike that strikes the courthouse, and so they are putting up this big cable to catch that energy to take to the car. And as they're making final preparations, Doc Brown realizes that Marty has put an envelope in his pocket that tells him about happens, what happens in the future, that he's going to get shot by the terrorists on the day that Marty's going back to in the future. But Doc Brown sees the envelope and he gets really angry and he tears it up and he says something about knowledge of the future messing up the space-time continuum. In other words, Doc Brown didn't want knowledge of the future to affect how he asked it, acted in the past that would change the future. Make perfect sense? Anyway, so Marty goes back to 1985. Doc Brown gets shot again, but this time he's wearing a bulletproof vest because Doc Brown had pieced that little letter back together and the knowledge of his future changed how he lived in the past. And, and so that should affect us as well. So let me ask you a, an important question. If I were to hand you an envelope that told the details of your death, when and how you die, would you want to know? How many of you would want to know? That's about the same as for about just a few. Who wouldn't want to know? Yeah, most of you, same first hour. Now here's, I think it depends on how I die, I think. Like if I'm gonna die a month from now because a grizzly bear escapes from the zoo and eats me alive, I don't wanna know that. But if I live to like 117 years old and I die at the end of running a marathon and my wife dies a couple of hours later just thanking God for her long life with me, I, I probably wanna know that. I would wanna see that. <laughs> well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up the Old Testament book of Joshua chapter 1, we're wrapping up our Wanderer series today, and we've talked about how the Israelites have traveled from captivity in Egypt to the promised land. And if you've been here every week during this series, you know that they've had some ups and downs along the way. The initial journey took them about two years to get to the promised land, and on the way they saw some cool stuff. God parted the Red Sea so that they could cross on dry land. They were fed with manna and, and quail that just literally appeared from heaven for them. They got to see Moses go up on Mount Sinai and all kind of cool light shows going on. And then he came down with the Ten Commandments from God. But when they got to the 
promised land after about two years, it takes a pretty ugly turn for the worse because Moses sends 12 men into the promised land to kind of scout it out. And so these dudes go in for about 40 days, scout around, and they come back and they tell the Israelites, it is pretty cool. I mean, it's an amazing place, but there's some really, really big dudes in there. I don't think we can take those guys. And there were only two of them that were like, no, we can do this. But the Israelites decide it's probably better if they just don't go into the promised land. Well, as you can imagine, God is not really happy about that because he had told them that he was giving them this land and he had promised to protect them. So he allows them to wander back into the desert. They wander around for 38 more years. They finally get back to the exact same place just across the Jordan River from the promised land. And it's in that moment we talked about last week where Moses sins against God and his punishment is he's not allowed to go into the promised land either. And so we pick up our story of the Israelites are going to cross today into the promised land. This is Joshua 1, starting with verses 1 through 6. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all of the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. So this is a big moment for the Israelites. Joshua is now in charge, and he is in charge of leading them across into the promised land. And so they're going to be led across by the Ark of the Covenant. You've probably seen pictures of the Ark of the Covenant, but that's where the presence of God was. Now, they don't know exactly what to expect when they cross over. They've heard some things from 38 years before about how cool the land is, but they're not really sure, but they know they're excited because this is the land that God has promised them. And they're going to get to follow in God's presence on the Ark of the Covenant. Let's look at Joshua 3, 14 through 16. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge... The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. So imagine this scene. There are three million Israelites about to cross the River Jordan. And so priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, they go and they get up and it's, the water is there. It's deep because it's the flood season. These guys are probably going to have to swim, but they know what God has promised to do. And when they touch the edge, God parts the waters of the Jordan. The Jordan starts flowing upstream so that they can walk across on dry land. What's God reminding them of? Parting of the Red Sea. He's reminding them what happened at the very beginning of this journey where his power showed up and parted the Red Sea. Just imagine what it should have looked like with the procession following the Ark of the Covenant across this water just piled up in the air as they cross. So if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, you've seen a depiction of the Ark of the Covenant. It's this wood box that's overlaid with gold. It's a beautiful box. I'll show you an illustration right here so you can kind of see an artist's conception of probably what it looked like based on the description. But the Ark of the Covenant is called the Ark of the Covenant because it was a visual reminder to Israel of God's promise and covenant with them. God promised to be their God and they would be his people. And so that was the reminder of that. But this Ark also had the presence of God. God's presence would often hover below the angel's wings, just above the lid. And so sometimes we read about in the Old Testament, the power of God showing up through the Ark of the Covenant. That's what drove the movie, movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, the, the fun in that movie. But that's the Ark of the Covenant. But the coolest thing about the Ark of the Covenant is the, the top part, that lid. Underneath that lid, if you'd opened it up back then, you would have seen the tablets containing the Ten Commandments. But that lid is something called the mercy seat, and that's where God's presence would hover. The ark would eventually be kept in the temple in Jerusalem after it was built many years later in a place called the Holy of Holies, the most holy part. While the Israelites were traveling in the desert, when they would set up camp, it would be in the most inner part of the tabernacle. And that mercy seat is so important to the Israelites because the, the most important ceremony that happened once a year involved that mercy seat. 
the, the, the high priest, one time a year, would go in, they would sacrifice an animal, he would take the blood of that animal into the Holy of Holies, and he would sprinkle the blood onto the mercy seat. That, the name mercy seat actually comes from the, the Hebrew word that means to atone for or to cleanse. And so through that ceremony, the high priest would appease God. He would satisfy the sins of the people with God. Now, that's a beautiful depiction of what Jesus is ultimately going to do with uh, for us because he is our presence of God, and he was the ultimate sacrifice. Do you see the beautiful symbolism of the mercy seat and Jesus? He was the blood sacrifice. that He gave his life so that we could be forgiven once and for all. And then just like the ark led the Israelites into the promised land, Jesus will one day lead us into heaven. Do you see this amazing, there's amazing theological connection and symbolism between the promised land for the Israelites and heaven for us. Heaven is the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to us that we will one day have a home. That as we travel through this life, just like the Israelites travel through the desert, we are headed to home. And so this is the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to us to live with us. Look at how this comes up in the, in the book of John Jesus is visiting with his closest followers, and, and they're really nervous at this point because they've realized Jesus is probably going to go away. They don't exactly understand how or why, but that Jesus is going to leave them, and they're very nervous about that. And Jesus comfort them, comforts them with the promise of heaven. Look at John 14, 1 through 3. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? He's talking about heaven here. And he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. So Jesus is telling his followers, there's a heaven. I'm going there now, but you're going to go later. And I'm one day going to come back and take you home to be with me. You know, just like those 12 spies brought back a little peek into the Israelites' promised land, the Bible gives us a little peek into our eternal home in heaven as well. You may not know this, obviously the book of Revelation talks a lot about that, but there are other books of the Bible in both the New and the Old Testament that give us a little peek into what heaven is going to look like. And I want to read one description about heaven from Revelation, this is in chapter 21, this is verse 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Do you see the connection of the promise, the covenant God had with the Israelites? I'll be your God, you'll be my people. We're getting that for us in Revelation. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. I love this last verse 7. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Again, it's this connection to the Israelites and their promised land. That's our connection to heaven. So just like Israel didn't fully realize what they were going to see in the promised land, we don't fully understand what we're going to see in heaven. We've got some little peaks. We've got some stories, but I don't even think we can really even comprehend it. Even if we could see it, I'm not sure we could take it all in. But I want you to try next time you're seeing a beautiful sunset or a sunrise or you're looking at a mountain view that's majestic or watching the, the ocean and with all its power and beauty and majesty, I want you to remind yourself about heaven. I want you to just look at that and go, wow, God's creation is amazing. But that's just a little taste of what it's going to look like in heaven. That's how we can get a little picture of what it might look like. But I want to tell you a couple of things about heaven that the Bible makes clear to us so that you can better understand this promise of God for our promised land one day in heaven. Here's the first thing. We will know and be known. The Bible says that in heaven, we're going to get new physical bodies. This old body that is worn out, gets fat, my knees are all torn up. You're going to watch me hobble down the stairs here in a minute. 
That body's going to be gone. We get a new physical body. Now, remember Tom and Jerry? You saw the little picture of heaven with them floating on a cloud playing a little harp? That ain't right. That's not what it is. We're going to have physical bodies. We're not going to float around and play a harp. And if I'm going to play an instrument, it's going to be the electric guitar. That's what I'm going to play. But when we have these new bodies, we are going to know one another and we're going to get to know God. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. He said, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. Here's what he's saying. We're going to get to know Jesus face to face. We're going to get to look into his face. We're going to get to see friends and family members that have gone on before us. We're going to get to see family from across the world that we never got to meet. We're going to meet relatives from generations ago that we never saw in this life. We will know and be known. Well, what does that mean? It means we're going to have deep, meaningful relationships. There's not going to be any loneliness. There's not going to be any gossip. There's not going to be any cliques or hatred. There's not going to be any secrets. There's no sin, so there's nothing for us to hide. We will have these deep and meaningful relationships. Just imagine what that might be like. Maybe you decide you want to have coffee with the Apostle Paul, or you want to go fishing with, with Peter, or, or maybe some of you ladies or men want to make cookies with Mother, the Mary, of, Mary, Mary Mother of Jesus, and maybe your great-great-grandmother. I'm going to come eat those cookies because in heaven, they're not going to make me fat. What do you want to do? Who do you want to reconnect with? Like, I'm going to have a jam session on the electric guitar with Moses because you know that dude was a rocker. And I'm going to be way more talented. My voice is not going to screech like dead cats when I, when I sing. Just imagine what that's going to be like to spend all of eternity making and growing those relationships. Here's another thing about heaven. We will work, and the second part's big, and actually like it. Right? Because heaven is clear that it's a recreation of the perfection from the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve had chores or jobs in the, in the garden. But, but they didn't call them chores. They loved it. It's only when sin entered the picture that work well, became work. We're going to have these different responsibilities. And we understand that they're important. The Bible tells us that we will even judge angels in heaven. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what it means. But it sounds like our jobs are going to be important jobs. And we're going to love doing them. Revelation 22 says that we're going to spend time serving God. Can, can you just imagine working on some project that you love? You never get tired of it, and this 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 beautiful thing that you're working on. I, I don't know what that looks like, but maybe you don't cook very well in this life, and maybe you want to make dinner for Jesus and a few thousand of your closest friends in heaven, or, or maybe you want to paint or sculpt, and your paintings and sculptures turn out even more beautiful than Rembrandt's or Monet's. I also think we're going to learn the mysteries of the universe in heaven. I, I don't actually think we're going to know everything just automatically when we get to heaven. I think we're going to get to spend all of eternity learning about the majesty and power of God and the beauty of his creation. What does that maybe look like? Maybe, maybe we get to explore the inside of an active volcano without feeling like we're in a Houston summer or no fear about what might happen to us. Maybe we decide to go check out some distant planets with no spaceship or spacesuit. I, I don't know what that looks like but I know it's going to be cool. Maybe we get to replay cool scenes from history. You know, parting of the Red Sea, playing now, be a part of that. And then afterwards, fajitas with Moses, because there's going to be a little Texas in heaven. You know that's coming, right? I don't know what that looks like, but I'm told it's going to be majestic. And so we need to take time to think about what that might be. Imagine learning and never being overwhelmed by the information. Imagine having all of eternity to just take in and see the beauty and majesty of God over and over and over again. In heaven, we'll get to worship God uninhibited. We won't be separated by distance. We won't be separated by our sin. We'll be able to see face to face all of this and no more mourning, no more sadness, no more tears, no more death, for the old order has passed away. God is making everything new. Does that sound like a place you want to spend eternity in? Our glimpse into heaven should help us prepare for our future. Just like Doc Brown saw the future and it affected how he lived in the moment, getting a glimpse of our eternal paradise, our eternal home in our promised land ought to change the way we think and the way we live right now. 
Here's the first thing that ought to change is our understanding of this truth. This life isn't our home. See, I think we get so caught up in this life. We have so many things going on. We have so many places we have to be, so many responsibilities, and we're working so hard to try to save for this life and to make this life happy. We forget that this is just the journey. This is little, the brief little journey, just like Israel traveled for 40 years through the desert, and it was tough. There were some difficult circumstances, and they stumbled and fell. But I bet when they were crossing the Jordan, all of that was a distant memory because they were now going home. And so that's what it's like for us because that is eternity. You know, the Bible describes this life by saying it's a mist. In other words, you spray out of a spray bottle, mist comes, and it goes. It's so short. It doesn't last. Whether you get 80, 90, 100 years, this life will be over before you know it. And then we'll be in our promised land of heaven. And the Bible tells us that after 100,000 years in heaven, and the party's just getting started. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says that we ought to have our focus on this world and the next world. Look, look at what he said. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what, what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul's saying we got to focus on heaven. I, I like to think about this passage of Scripture like a camera and the focus on a camera. right? You can either focus on something close up and what happens to things off in the distance. Blurry. And if you focus off in the distance, the things up close become a little less in focus. And what Paul is telling us is our focus should be out in the distance to our future home in heaven. And so it causes the things of this world to be a little less important, a little less focused. Here's why this is so important. Just imagine that you go on vacation with your family and you guys rent a beach house down in Galveston. It real pretty pictures on the internet. You book it, you get down there. It doesn't really look like the pictures. It needs some paint. Looks like there might be a roof leak or two. There's no flowers in the flower beds. It's just all kind of it's grown up. And you get inside, and it could use some work too. And so you decide, you know what? I'm going to go to Lowe's. And so you go to Lowe's. You spend all of your savings, all your retirement money to buy supplies. And you spend the whole week working on the outside and the inside, planting new flowers in the flower bed. And by the time you leave a week later, it looks pretty good. And then you leave, and you never come back. Right? Would you do that? Of course not. Because that house is not your home. And, and that's kind of the same way this life is for us. It, it's really not our home. And yet we put so much effort and energy and resources into trying to make this life the very best. And we kind of forget about the life that really matters. But the life where our effort should be is the one that's eternal. Here's the th second thing that heaven should remind us of. We will live forever. No matter who you are, you are going to have an eternal existence. And the question is, will that be a, in a place called heaven that we've been talking a little bit about, or is it in a place called hell? And, and you guys know that, most of you, you've heard that before, but, but here's what you may not know, is how you get there. How do you get to heaven? You know, I think so many people kind of think it's based on you know, kind of how do you live life. I mean, you try to be a good person, you try to do good things. I, I think a lot of people think about Christianity kind of like this big old-fashioned scale. Do you remember those things, those balancing scales, right? So you, good stuff you do, it kind of tips this way. Bad stuff you do, it tips this way. And if you do enough good stuff, you get to go to heaven. And if it tips this way because you did enough bad stuff, you go somewhere else. But that's not how it works. Being a Christian isn't about not kicking dogs or liking old people. That's not how it works. It is about what was done for us. But so many people think that it's about trying to follow some rules. And for a lot of you, that's really discouraged you about church and about Christianity. Because it, you, maybe you went to a church when you were growing up and it felt like the preacher looked right at you every Sunday, Sunday and said, you blew it again this week. Thanks, thanks for playing. Maybe you'll measure up next week. But you never did. And so you became discouraged with church. Maybe even be, became discouraged with Christianity because it felt like you could never measure up. And, and some of you guys have gone the opposite direction. I mean, you, you just feel like, hey, if I go to church every once in a while and I'm a pretty good person, 
I should be all right. Neither one of those things are true. Being a Christian is not about how much good stuff and bad stuff you've done. It is about being saved by grace through your faith. That's how that works. So what is faith? Faith is a belief about Jesus that is so strong that it causes you to repent of your sins and live differently. You have a belief that Jesus is who he says he is and that he's done what he claims to have done that's so strong that it changes who you are. That belief is simple. It's that Jesus is God, that he came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for an atoning death for your sins. On the third day, he rose from the dead, and one day, he's going to come back and take us home to our promised land in heaven. That's the belief that Jesus is the Son of God. We, we see this belief from the disciples in Matthew chapter 16. This is verses 15 and 16. And in this little section, uh, Jesus says, look, who do, who do people say I am? And the disciples say, well, like, you know, some people say John the Baptist. Some people say Elijah or one of the other prophets. And then look what Jesus says. He says, but what about you? He said, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That is the belief that unifies us as Christians. We have that belief so strongly that it changes who we are. It means, here's the deal. No matter how much you like our church, no matter how good a preacher you think Chris is, or how good looking you think I am, none of that makes you a Christian. It does give you good taste, but it doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is believing that Jesus is who he says he is, and you follow after him in your life. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will be in heaven. That's the promise. That's the covenant that we have with God. Not because of what you've done, but because of what was done for you. Just like the Israelites were God's people, and so they got to follow God through in the Ark of the Covenant across the Jordan into the Promised Land. Jesus will one day come and take us home to our eternal promised land in heaven. And that's going to happen either when he returns or when we die, whichever happens first. Look back at how this story of Israel crossing the Jordan River kind of wraps up. This is Joshua 4, 1 through 7. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe. And tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of Israelites, to serve as a sign among you in the future. When your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, these waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So this crossing of the Jordan was a big deal, and God wanted them to mark that moment. So imagine what's happening here. The Ark of the Covenant travels out to the middle of the Jordan. It's now dry. The water is piling up. And these 12 men, they come and they get stones, and they carry those stones to the place they camped the first night. And then they built a memorial to mark the moment. And this is just one of many times in the Old Testament where the Israelites mark a moment. They would often build an altar when something special happened, or they actually had ceremonies and feasts that marked moments. Like the Passover was actually a feast that marked the moment of the death angel or the spirit of God passing over their houses when the last plague of Egypt took place. And so they would mark these moments. And this was a moment where God fulfilled his promise to take his people home to the promised land. And we still mark moments today. We just took communion a few minutes ago. And that is marking the moment. That is marking the moment or remembering where Jesus died on the cross, the, the, the greatest thing that ever happened for us in our entire existence. We're remembering. But the biggest way we mark a moment as individuals is baptism. Baptism by immersion is marking the moment when everything changes. It's marking the moment when we go from death to life, the moment that we become a new creation in God, the moment that we accept the offer to become God's children and to spend eternity with him in heaven. It's marking the moment that our eternal destination changes. Look at how the apostle says this in Romans 6, 3 through 5. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul is saying here that baptism marks the moment of when we became a new creation. But he says more than that. He says this is marking the moment of when we went from death to life, when we, just like Jesus rose from the dead, we will one day rise from the dead. This life isn't the end. When we die, this isn't the end of our eternal existence. Verse 5 saying, just like Jesus rose, so do we. Baptism is a marker. It marks that moment of what's happening inside when everything changes. Here's why this is such a big deal. Jesus is very clear that we're to baptize by immersion. He, the great commission that he gave right before he went back to heaven, what's his, his command to us? Go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was his command to us. And we also know that Jesus was baptized. He was baptized by immersion by John the Baptist. Now, what you may not know is that Jesus walked 60 miles, roughly, each way to be baptized. And I think he did that to show us how important that moment is, that marking that moment. Here's something else you may not know. The English word baptism actually comes from the Greek word. It's tr translated from the Greek word baptizo. And baptizo wasn't literally translated. It was a, it's called a transliteration. They made a word that sounds like baptizo. Baptizo became baptism. But that Greek word that Paul used when he wrote these scriptures was baptizo. And that literally means to plunge or to dunk or to immerse. And so if we look at that same scripture again, verses 3 and 4, it could have literally be translated to look like this. Or don't you know that all of us who were immersed into Christ Jesus were immersed into his death? We were therefore buried with him through immersion into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That's the Greek word. It means to plunge or to dunk. The reality is there weren't any first century Christians back in the New Testament that were running around unbaptized. That's what they did. They followed Jesus and they baptized him. That marked the moment. That's why it's such a big deal to us. I'm so excited to tell you we have three baptisms already scheduled for next week. That'll make, I think, yeah, you can clap for that. <laughs> That'll be 13 for this year, so four more than we had all of last year. And we still got five months to go. I'm pretty pumped about that. But three people next week are going to mark a moment, the moment that everything changed, the moment when they followed Jesus, the moment that they accept that covenant from God to spend eternity with him. And if you're here and you've never followed Jesus, man, I would encourage you to make that decision to follow Jesus. And you can be baptized too. We can get you scheduled for next week as well. Or, or maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time, but you've never marked the moment the way the Bible tells us to. I'd encourage you to do that next week. Maybe you're thinking about following Jesus and being baptized, but as you sit there, you're thinking, man, I think I've probably messed up too bad. I'm not, I'm not sure that what I've done is, is capable of being recovered from. Let me encourage you with this. Being a Christian is almost not at all about what you've done. It's about what was done for you. And that's a huge difference. Let me tell you, the Apostle Paul that we've read a lot of his scripture from today, the greatest missionary of all time, do you know what he was doing just before he became a Christian? Beating up and killing Christians. His job was to travel from city to city and round up mobs of Jewish people, and they would beat Christians, they would arrest Christians, and sometimes they would even kill them. Actually, when he met Jesus, he was on the road to go to another city to arrest more Christians. But in the moment that he met Jesus, everything changed. And nothing mattered about what he had done before. It only mattered what he decided in that moment. So whatever things you've done in your past, maybe whatever you've done last night, you can't stick with Paul. It, it really doesn't matter where you've been before this moment. It, it only matters what you decide in this moment. How awesome would it be to be given a clean slate, a fresh start, See, to prepare for our future, we have to remind ourselves that this world is not our home. Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us that God has set eternity in the hearts of humans. In other words, we know deep down that this isn't all there is. 
We, we know that this life isn't what we were really meant for. We were meant for something beyond this life. This life doesn't truly fulfill. C.S. Lewis once said it this way, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. You were made for another world. That's what you were made for. You were made to share eternity with God as his children in the promised land. The Jewish people, they had weathered 40 years of struggle and travel and hardship. But in that moment, when they were crossing over the Jordan, going into their promised land, none of that mattered. It was all a distant ministry, memory, because they were going home. That's the way this life can be for us. As followers of Jesus, there's going to be some difficulty. There'll be some sacrifice. There'll be some hardship. But the destination is worth the difficulty. Lil and I have four kids, and I want to tell you, those labor and deliveries have been really hard on me. I mean, I have to sit there for hours sometimes in a, a chair that's really not very comfortable. And only a, every couple of hours, I get to go down and get something to drink or eat and a snack. It, it, ladies, I, I wish you could have experienced so you would know the pain that <laughs> I've gone through. Now, we, we have four kids, and each time... It's been very difficult on my wife. Labor has taken longer than we hoped for. It was more difficult than we imagined. But at the end, we have a child. And in the end, nothing really matters. So after our first was born, Ashley, Lil decided she wanted to have the next one naturally, that no epidural, no drugs. And so as we get close to the due date, she kind of sits me down and she says, okay, so here's the thing. When I'm in labor, at some point, I'm going to ask you for an epidural, and you tell me no. She said, at some point, I'm probably going to beg you for an epidural, and you stay strong. You just, were you ready to be a breathing coach? No yeah, and I agreed to that because well, I'm not very smart. <laughs> and so I, I go to the hospital with this one, and I, I'm ready to be the best labor and delivery coach ever. We get in there, and labor stalls out for Lil with Cameron. Goes a total of about nine hours. And about five hour, hours in, I mean, she's hurting and she's tired and she looks at me and says, honey, can I have an epidural? And I said, no, baby, you can do this. Breathe. <laughs> You're right? And at first she was, you know, kind of breathing along with me and 15, 20 minutes later, she said, baby, I, I, I really need the epidural. And I'm like, no, honey, you can do it. You can do it. And this goes on and please get more and more aggressive and I, and I'm not making this up. Eventually, she stands up in the bed, all the way up with stuff hanging off of her, and grabs me by the collar and says, Give me the epidural. <laughs> I thought I was experiencing some end times prophecy right there. <laughs> the doctor who had delivered our first one, too, looked over at me and goes, I'd give her the epidural. <laughs> she got the epidural. So later, we're in the room. She's holding Cameron. And I look at my wife with nothing but pure love in my heart. And I look at her and I say, the next time we have a baby, one of us is getting drugs. <laughs> I don't care which one, but one of us is getting drugs. Every time labor took longer than we hoped for, it was harder than we imagined. But in the end, we had a child. In this life, there'll be sacrifice and difficulty and hardship. But the end is worth the wait. At the end, we're not even going to remember the sacrifice. See, I, I don't know how you're going to go into eternity. Maybe that's when Jesus returns. Maybe it's when you die. Maybe that's 50 years from now. Maybe that's as you're traveling home from church today. I don't know what that looks like for you. But I do know this. If you believe Jesus, he says we get this one life, this, this one opportunity to follow him and to prepare ourselves for eternity. And that's why it's so important for us to take days like today where we take a little peek into eternity because understanding eternity should change the way we live now. In other words, true belief requires action. Let's pray.